Hey, welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and it's time for five cases in five minutes, thoracic imaging number three. I'm going to show each unknown case slide for about 10 seconds, and you can pause to study the images further if you'd like. I'll then review the findings, reveal the diagnosis, and move to the next case. Are you ready? Let's go. Case one, CT chest. All right, so this is a nice example of right lower lobe pneumonia and left lower lobe atelectasis with bilateral pleural effusions. So how can you differentiate pneumonia from atelectasis? Well, typically, atelectatic lung will enhance more and be brighter than consolidated lung filled with pneumonia. And that's because atelectatic lung is just normal lung that's collapsed, whereas in pneumonia, the alveoli are filled with pus, debris, and bacteria, and that will not enhance, and so that lung will look darker. And also, notice how with the atelectatic lung, there's volume loss. So you can see that lung is collapsed there, the lobe is very small, and it's surrounded by this effusion. Whereas with the consolidated lung filled with pneumonia, it's just kind of floating on top of the effusion. It's taking up space. So you don't see any volume loss. And there was actually a nice study by Edwards et al. that showed a threshold of 92 Hounsfeld units diagnosed pneumonia with 97% sensitivity and 85% specificity. And in this case, you can see that the consolidated lung does have a low Hounsfeld units of 50. That's below 92 whereas the atelectatic lung has a Hansfeld unit density of about 118. Now this is typically just a visual assessment. You don't usually have to actually measure the density, but it does underscore the importance of how contrast can be quite helpful in differentiating atelectasis from pneumonia. All right, case two, this is a chest X-ray of a patient with tuberous sclerosis who's a non-smoker. Slide two of two, CT chest. All right, so this chest x-ray is very subtle, but there is this fine reticulation throughout the lungs, and that's due to the small cysts that we see subsequently on the CT chest. And you can see one of these cysts faintly outlined in the right mid-lung here. Now, the CT chest shows much better all these numerous cysts scattered throughout the lungs. And notice how all the cysts are small, uniform, and have very thin walls. And they're diffusely throughout the lungs. We don't see any sparing of the lung bases. And that would be atypical for central lobular emphysema, which tends to have an upper lung predominance. And also, again, the patient's a non-smoker. So in a female patient with tuberous sclerosis, this is typical for lymphangiomyomatosis, which for obvious reasons we tend to just call LAM. <laughs> And this is a rare multi-system disorder that can occur sporadically, but often occurs in association with the tuberous sclerosis complex. And if the patients are symptomatic, they usually have exertional dyspnea. And two things to remember for complications of LAM is that patients can have recurrent pneumothorax and then also chylothorax, which is a chylus effusion. You might even see a dilated thoracic duct. And again, the key is that the cysts are uniform and diffusely scattered throughout the lung. All right, next case, this is a 30-year-old smoker, chest x-ray. Slide two of two, CT chest. So at first glance, you might think this looks just like the chest x-ray for the patient with LAM. <laughs> and it is pretty subtle, but there, instead of just fine reticular markings, we're seeing this reticular nodular pattern throughout the lungs here. See these little nodules? And then if we look at the chest CT, we can see that that's due to these multiple cysts that have kind of a bizarre irregular shape with irregularly thickened walls. Notice how this is different from the patient with LAM. Also, we see a few faint ground glass nodules scattered throughout the lungs as well. It's not just cysts here. It's a combination of cysts and nodules. And then a key point here is that the lung bases are relatively spared. Notice how the costophrenic angles have no involvement. So in a 30-year-old smoker, this is typical for pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So this type of LCH occurs in young adult smokers. But you can also have lung involvement as part of disseminated LCH, which we typically see in pediatric patients that have skeletal manifestations. But that's less common to have pulmonary involvement. So this type of smoking-related LCH tends to occur in patients 20 to 40 years of age. And it will have these reticular nodular opacities and the bizarre shape of the cyst with the regularly thickened walls. So the distribution is key, the fact that the lung bases are relatively spared. And one way you can remember this is that central alveolar emphysema also tends to involve the upper lungs, the smoking-related emphysema, as well as RBILD, which is respiratory bronchiolitis interstitial lung disease, another smoking-related disease that tends to have an upper lung predominance. And one of the main differential diagnoses for this imaging appearance would be cystic fibrosis, because when you first look at this, you might think that we're looking at irregular bronchiectasis throughout the lungs, but then the coronal reformats are helpful in this case, showing that these are all individual cysts. They're not connected. They're just isolated cystic regions as opposed to a contiguous tubular structure. All right, case four, chest x-ray. Slide 
slide two of two, CT chest, and what could you do next to confirm the diagnosis? Okay, so on this chest x-ray, you can see that this EKG lead is getting in the way here, but there is a faint nodular density here at the right lung apex. There's also hyperinflation of the lungs with emphysematous changes. Looking at the coronal reformatted CT chest, you can see that that nodular density is actually within a large cavity here at the right lung apex, and we have bilateral apical bulla. Also, again, the lungs have emphysematous change and are hyperinflated. Then if we look at the axial CT here with the lung windows, you can see that that cavity is thin-walled, and there's that nodular density within the cavity. Again, look at all that emphysematous change bilaterally. On the soft tissue windows, you can see that the nodule does have soft tissue density and also has a few calcifications here. So even though this is a thin-walled cavity, you want to make sure that this is not a cavitating lung carcinoma with a mural nodule. So what could you do next? Well, you could actually scan the patient again in the prone position. Ideally, you want to do that with a low-dose technique. But here's the original supine series here where the table is back here. And notice the nodule is dependent. And then when we flip the patient and they're laying on their chest, the nodule remains dependent. It follows gravity, so it moves. If this was a cancer with a mural nodule, it would remain fixed to that posterior wall. Also, notice how the cyst cavity decreases in size as well. And that's just due to physiologic compression from the surrounding lung due to differences in patient position. So this is diagnostic of aspergilloma. So these are mass-like fungus balls composed of aspergillus mixed with mucus and cellular debris filling a cavity. And this is a non-invasive type of pulmonary aspergillosis. So other types of aspergillosis would include ABPA, which is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. That typically occurs in asthmatic patients, and it gives you that finger and glove appearance of mucus-impacted bronchiectasis. Another type is the angioinvasive type, which typically only occurs in patients who are immunocompromised, and that gives you the classic halo sign where you have a solid nodule surrounded by ground glass representing hemorrhage. So aspergillomas occur in patients that have normal immunity but abnormal lungs. Their lungs have pre-existing cavities. Most commonly that's due to post-primary tuberculosis, but also emphysema and sarcoidosis, anything that gives you a cavity for an aspergilloma to set up shop in. <laughs> And this appearance of a solid nodule with surrounding gas is known as the monod sign, that's M-O-N-O-D, which just describes the gas surrounding the fungus ball in a cavity. Technically, that's different than the air crescent sign, which you see in patients recovering from angioinvasive aspergillosis. Some sources will use these terms interchangeably, though, and I'll leave it up to you to decide how much of an academic battle you want to get into with your colleagues about the nomenclature of aspergillosis. <laughs> All right, last case, history of trauma, CT chest. So here in the right lung in particular, we have multiple patchy airspace opacities, some of which have a ground glass appearance as well. And in the setting of trauma, that's consistent with pulmonary contusion. Also, notice that in these larger opacities, we also have areas of gas. So when you have gas within an area of pulmonary contusion, that's consistent with a traumatic nematocele or laceration. So this was a pulmonary contusion and nematocele scattered throughout the right lung. So in addition to pneumothoraces, other gas-containing structures that you might detect in trauma would include lacerations and nematocele. And a component of this airspace or ground glass opacity is likely hemorrhage. Also, if we focus in on this area of laceration here in the right lower lobe, you can see that that portion of affected lung is visibly upset. But don't expect that to be a consistent finding. <laughs> Hey, that's it for five cases in five minutes, thoracic imaging number three. Hopefully you enjoyed this lecture, and if so, please subscribe to Radiologist Headquarters on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. It would be miraculous if you shared these lectures with even just one person or left a podcast review. You can also leave a comment or a question on YouTube, and I'll do my best to answer it. Visit us at radiologisthq.com for more info and to follow us on social media to get updates. Thanks, and have a great day. Mm -hmm.